So I want to welcome on stage the moderator of the next panel, someone that's a dear friend. He comes from the belly of the beast, working at one of the largest VCs in Spain from Nauta Capital. He's also been on the board of some of the biggest companies in this country, uh, been on the board of Carto, been on the board of Min uh, Minube, and iContainers, I believe. And so please welcome Oriol Juncosa. So let me actually, so you want to give an intro or I call your peers? You know, uh, um, is, is it fine? Okay, so um, guys, here I'm, I'm just super excited to have this panel on, on, on a scaling B2B. First one here will be Miguel Arias, CEO Woo! of Come on, guys. Um, uh, the leader in location in I intelligence. Uh, next one is Javier de Riva, co-founder of Users Room. Woo! Okay, and and the last and the last but not least is uh, Philippe Jellis, CEO of Cantox. Uh, Come on, there we go. <laughs> More money and less rounds. Excellent. So, so uh, guys, just. Uh, uh, to put you in perspective, I mean, here uh, um, on, on a stage, we have uh, three of the best uh, B2B companies that ho have come out of uh, Spain in, in recent years. Funny enough, none of them have the headquarters in Spain, okay, which is interesting. Uh, amongst all of them have raised over 100 million, okay, and they are really ready to tell us about the, the secrets uh, for for expanding and the secrets of, about uh, sort of reaching this 100 million revenue. Okay, so so th thanks for uh, thanks for joining in, in the panel. So, so, so basically, what we wanted uh, to do today is, is to talk about, I mean, how you guys have moved your organization towards that goal. No? So so first would be how is your organization? I mean, your senior management evolving. I mean, as you, as you grow from sort of the first, um, let's say, the first 15, 20 people to, I mean, s s some of you right now have over 100 people on, on your organization. So at the level of the senior management, what have you done to sort of to make it solid? You Anyone? You want me to take the first one? I take the, the difficult one is for me. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you, you should fake it till you make it. And so from... From zero to 40, you can sweat it yourself and you can just stretch your capacities up to the infinite. But there is some point where you cannot fake it anymore, right? After 40, 50 people, and then you suddenly grow and you raise Series B, you go from 50 to 100 in four months, and then things get complicated. The management bandwidth is just impossible to manage. So you, don't, you, you are then the bottleneck of the company. So it's the, the moment to add some seniority. And it's not easy because all the rest <coughs> of the exec team till that day are probably friends for the last three, four years that built everything from scratch together. They remember the good old times where everything was done by you yourself. So then when you add somebody with a more or a corporate back background who knows how to do things with processes and they come in and they just say to you, oh, I would assume this would be already ready, you feel really pissed off because you, you are the ones who were sweating for the last two, three years, right? So it's very hard to add somebody and give them the room and the leash to be able to do things while they're going to first be destroying a lot of things that you did before, right? So we added uh, already seniority in sales and marketing, and it's, it's super important to our people that can take weight, and it's, it's very useful. But this initial shock, when you, you feel bad about yourself because you think you did everything wrong till that day, and they come with things that you feel would not work for you, it's a very, very uncomfortable moment. I think that in a, in a fast-paced uh, company, the every year or every couple of years, you're changing the whole uh, company structure. So you need new departments, you need, you need uh, new, new, new management. And the management that you need when you are 30 people is not the same management that you need when you are 100 or you're going to go for, for 200. So sometimes it's painful, but you also have to change. I mean, it's very difficult to find people that can go from zero to 200 people is uh, the, 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 the manager that is, uh, works very well for a company of 200 employees doesn't work well with a company of 30 people. And the, the, the management that works very well in, with 30, 30 people doesn't work well in 200. So sometimes it's painful because you have to change important pieces, 
but uh, you have to do it. And there is another thing I would, I would highlight, is that uh, one of the, th of, of the things that, that change uh, a lot is that when you're, when you're starting, you have, to, uh, you have to try to find the talent in someone that doesn't have the experience, but you interview him and you, it looks like it can be a good, a good, uh, a good uh, professional. When you start to grow, you cannot do any, experience, any experiments anymore, and then you have to just look for people that has already done it and hire them. So in, in our case, in Kentox, I would say that Is it? we have not, yeah, you hear me? No? One, two, three. Okay, now that's fine, no? Yeah, now, now yeah. Okay, so let's say that Cantos, we have not been very successful at hiring senior managers. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, uh, we have hired a few of them and, and fired many of them. <laughs> uh, I think that in the end, there is, there is a big, uh, a usual mistake, which is when you are not good at something or wh when, you s when you feel you are missing some kind of organization or structure or processes in, in some specific thing, you think uh, I hire a senior guy, experienced, well paid, and he will fix it. Uh, I think it works 10% of the times, and 90% this fails. Uh, I think what you have to do from the very beginning is really to structure the company to be able, when senior managers are coming, to really extract value from them. But if you expect people from outside with a very different experience, usually with a background that makes that they are getting a bit less flexible than when they were more junior. Uh, very often, it's not a way to really fix problems inside the company. You always should think what I can do to make it as well as possible, and then let's try to bring people from outside. But bringing people from outside to fix things, I think it's not the right way to do it. You have first to fix it as much as you can, and then you bring people. Uh, uh, who of you would, would say that it is OK if you need to replace your sales team a couple of times, or that it usually happens. Well, no, you are replacing your sales team continually. Okay. <laughs> in, 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 extreme. No, extreme. No, <laughs> in, in, in B2B sales, uh, in, in Oracle, they fire 25% of the sales people every year. So, I mean, in B2B sales, if you want to be aggressive, by default, you will make many mistakes hiring people. So, you, you, you have a huge rotation. It's, it's a norm, meaning you cannot... People that say, oh, yeah, I have no rotation in my sales team, I immediately think, he probably has a shitty sales team. Because rotation in sales is normal, meaning you, you, you cannot have low rotation, it's not possible. Yeah. Well, we are particularly if you hire sales guys in the US, right? I mean, as, as Spaniards, I mean, when we hear somebody speaking with great accents, we think they are smart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this guy, he speaks <laughs> so well English, he's an Englishman, but he's speaks so well English, he must be smart. And then they sell themselves so well. They sell better themselves than how they sell your product, I would say. Yeah. So it's very difficult to hire sales guys in the US. Uh, uh, but oh, any profile, because all of them sell them th themselves very well. And, yeah. we, and we believe in this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the bad ones are selling themselves very well, and the great ones are also selling themselves very well. Yeah. So by default, you have to select as much as possible, and you know you will fire many of them. That, yeah. That's the game. So, someone at, at some time told me, if you need one sales rep, hire two. Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah, more or less, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, uh, uh, would you have to continue on the same thread of, of, of sales? I mean, in, in B2B, you always have sort of the top tail, the medium tail, the long tail of clients, so forth. No, I mean, how, when you're thinking about scaling, and particularly in your, in your own organizations, okay, how do you think about this, this mix of long tail versus medium tail versus Top tail. Some people say that, hey, in order to build a $100 million company, you need to have a lot of big elephants around. Some other people say, hey, maybe some, but this is costing a lot of money, long sell cycle. I mean, how do you think about it? I, I think you cannot concentrate on any segment. You need to choose one, so maybe you need to choose the elephants. Then you will have maybe the long tail coming, but you should not focus resources on the long tail in that sense. Focusing on every segment is just losing focus, I think, and it, it hardly work on the long run because it's, it's a different way to sell, it's a different way to acquire clients, a different cost, it's a different retention, it's a different way you manage your relationship. So I, I don't think any company, even the big ones, maybe I'm wrong, but are really good at serving any kind of customers. 
or maybe Oracle because they are acquiring so many companies or they are specific companies that have been integrated focusing on a different segment. But a company that's scaling cannot focus on, on, on each segment. I don't think it may work. The issue I would say, I mean, I, I love to live very strict uh, <laughs> what you're thinking, but how do you know, right? I mean, the, the volume versus value, what, what do you do? Because you, you have the half a million dollar deal, then you have all the $10,000 deals, and, and you have it, and you see it, and you see potential in both. So you need to decide, but how can you decide? Because there is no crystal ball telling you what the future is going to look like, right? I so see you, a you cannot decide in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. You need some time to then make a rational decision. Or not so rational, but I agree you cannot decide on the one. I, I agree 100 percent in which in what, in that you, you have to focus on one of the, of the segments. But w what I think is that uh, we are startups, and it means that we are entering new, new markets with a, with a new product. And nor normally, the, 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 the early adopters tend to be big companies. Small companies normally are not early adopters. And the, the, how, how I see is is that um, the, the problem with focusing at the, at the early stage in the small companies or medium companies is that maybe the market is not big enough to grow because there are not so much small companies and medium companies uh, uh, where you can sell your product at the, pri at the pricing that they want to pay. While if you focus on the, on the, on the big enterprise, you are selling big deals to, big deals to them. So you, with few companies, you're gonna be able to make big revenue, uh, and they tend to be, and if, uh, if you go to the States or to the UK even more, they tend to be early adopters, so they are more open to, to adopt your, your product. But, but some people may say that actually, um, due, due to the long sell cycle, you may be dead before you achieve the first uh, sale. No, no, yeah, yeah. this is Could that be a case as well? Yeah. I mean, I think about, say, I mean, how many B2B companies try to sell to Telefonica, no? And how many companies <laughs> really can no. achieve that? I, I cannot talk about that. Eh? Sorry. <laughs> 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 we are invested by Telefonica, so we are very happy. Oh, yes. Okay. You, know. you mentioned an interesting thing, and it's, it's not just the revenue model that they maybe do not pay you or they do not become customers. If, even if they become customers, they have so much leverage, they will try to change your product to adapt to what they want. They are so used to, now that I, I like Carto, but now that I like Carto with another flavor, let's make Carto 2. It's like, no, 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 I want to sell this 100 times. No, because I'm this big, I'm paying that much money, so I need you to be my own consultancy company. So it's a big fight that's difficult to, to battle. Because, because actually, uh, maybe you can explain a bit sort of, uh, because Carto has also been kind of sort of, um, I mean, sort of changing a bit, sort of the mix of customers. Maybe uh, you maybe started more early. Now you're bigger. Now you focus bigger. I mean, yeah. I mean, our focus initially was uh, even at the user level, like right? the Instagram of maps, yes. in a way, right? From there to the map aficionado or map interesting guy or the guy in organization. And more and more, we are moving to bigger deals where we do one big implementation, integration, everything. So, yeah. Interesting. And, and your experience seems to be the opposite. So yeah, we started from the. We started selling. Our, our first client was eBay. Our second client was IBM. Our third client was Google. And then from then, we had to say, okay, how many IBMs, Googles, and eBays are in the world? So we had to change the product in order to be able to sell to, to smaller companies. But smaller companies, but. Big okay. companies. I mean, okay. still big companies. So, so, I mean, as you can see, I mean, successful companies have very different approaches, but the interesting thing is that they evolve over time. No? I mean, they don't sort of stick with one and, and you can sort of try to find, try to find your way, which I think it's, it's, it's very important. Um, so, uh, then, in terms of uh, link to sales, there's the other part of marketing, no? And, so, and some people sometimes say, Okay, marketing in, in B2B is interesting, others say marketing in B2B is not interesting, some, some say marketing is more so for lead generation thing. How, how do you think about marketing and marketing plus sales when you are scaling the company? Well, season marketing is important for everyone, no? B2B or B2C, meaning it's not the same, the same kind of marketing, but clients have to know about you and have to be excited about your product and, and, and also by... Um, you as a salesperson or you as a, a company, uh, I would say, uh, a thought leader. So I, I, my view is that we spend a lot of time on marketing, but we spend 
very low amounts of marketing. Our marketing, for example, is super targeted to very specific people. So we spend a lot of time reaching them and trying to, to get the right messages, but we don't spend almost anything on advertising. So it's a very different marketing. But for me, anyone has to do marketing and B2B, same way. And it's more content marketing or? It's a mix, meaning uh, we, we do different things. First, we try to be uh, a thought leader in fintech and we are very visible and we are probably one of the 10 companies that are, that are more advanced in terms of, of thinking the future of fintech, so we are recognized for this. Then we have a lot of, of, of marketing which is based on, uh, we are building very unique solutions. So when you are building also products that are very unique and really answering very complex needs, it also helps. Because you, you're not pitching a client which has 50 competitors that are also pitching him. Um, but in the end, it's really being sure you, get, you give the right message to, to the right person. And when your potential clients are thousands of companies, not millions of people, you can do it in a super targeted way. So this is what, where I think the power of marketing in B2B is. When you have a very clear audience, and in that case, it's better if clients are a bit larger. If they are super small, it's a bit more complicated. But if they are a bit larger, you can really be super targeted and super focused. Mm -hmm. Any additional thoughts on? I have that? a thought mostly for enterprise SaaS, but I think we can all be on, the, on that the idea is everything compounds, not just the revenue, not just the number of customers. Any marketing initiative, this talk compounds mm -hmm. over, over time, right? Then somebody will register and talk to somebody else. So the more you're able to be top in mind, on online mapping solutions, location intelligence solutions, that will compound. So you should persevere a lot in your marketing efforts. Thanks. And I, I would add that in the mid long term, you win the war with marketing, you don't win the war with sales. So at the beginning, sales helps you in the short term to get revenue, but if you want to become the leader, you need marketing. You see, I think you, can, you will not be able to uh, become the leader with outbound. Yeah, one of our investors will say, your value, uh, your branding, or your, meaning your, your visibility or your company, uh, let's say, uh, branding, can improve your valuation 30% if you're really one of the top ones, independently of the revenue and the, and the financial metrics. So I, I think it's important to keep it in mind. So uh, uh, another key, um, key important thing related to sales, marketing, and so forth is international, no? I mean, how do you go about expanding, expanding internationally? And then uh, on that topic, there's always the discussion between US, not US, Asia, Latin America, which sometimes seems to be sort of, I mean, the first thing that we, uh, from Spain, we, we look into, but sometimes it's, it's maybe not, uh, uh, maybe a bit more deceptive. So how, how do you think about uh, in international and is the U.S. kind of sort of a must-have for, for, for all of you? I think that from a strategic point of view, you have to decide if you want to, if you want to become the, the world leader. And if you want to become the world leader, you have to win in the U.S., so no doubt, no, no doubt about it. Or you, or, or you see that there is a big player in the U.S. and you don't want to fight with that big player, uh, and then you, your strategy is to become the leader in, in Europe and at, at some point get acquired by, by, by this other, other competitor. Uh, I think d depending on which is the, situ the situation, you have to choose one or, or the other. For me, there is no reason why going to South America. I, I don't see any big reason because uh, I cannot see any, almost any benefit. Mm -hmm. And Asia, I don't know anything about. <laughs> <laughs> That's, thank you. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very valid, valid point. If you are very innovative in your technology, then you should go to the most innovative market and that will, that will be in that. Right? And once you do that, even going further in the US, US is just like a, it's a huge country, then I, I would even recommend for Spanish startups to be in New York and not in, in the Valley. Because in New York or in the Northeastern Corridor, you have all the big corporations, all the headquarters of all the big banks, big telcos, etc. while maybe that's your, your target more than the Silicon Valley big companies. And you, you gain much more life because you can travel in seven hours and it's just three hours less time difference. So the management of everything becomes so much easier. So I'm a big proponent of New York or, well, Philly, Boston, whatever. So North, Northeastern <coughs> Corridor for Spanish startups is doing B2B. We, we have an office in Silicon Valley with around 90 people. And 
I agree, it's nine hour difference. It's a, it's a nightmare uh, holding, the, holding the meter. Um, very, very expensive resources. There are lots of cons, but the good thing about, about it is that uh, very easy to find talent, talented people, the people that has already done IPOs in their previous companies, pe people that, ha uh, so it's very, it's much easier to build a, a A-class team. I think one important thing in speaking about it is, is to differentiate. We are speaking about B2B and, and it's important because very many people are very excited about the US. There is, a, in my view, a, a, a false dream about the US. But what's true is that in B2B, it's probably the only segment in which being European, you can go there and be reasonably ambitious. If you are B2C, no European tech company ever has become a leader in the US. So it's almost a it's, al it's almost shows you will fail because they are just uh, unbeatable locally. In B2B, it's different. In B2B, you have European companies that are able to be successful in the US when they have great technology and, and great positioning. Uh, so it's something key. And, and another thing we learn is you can, maybe you can hardly expand internationally uh, if you don't have in your new office uh, a founder which is bringing the culture. Yeah. So. Don't think that you can hire a senior guy in the US to bring your US office. Not be staff guy in the US alone trying to sell your product. It doesn't work. You always need a founder. Yeah. You always need the culture locally, so it's only a founder that will bring the culture. Excellent. So, uh, guys, what would be the three metrics, the three KPIs that keep you really sort of awake at night? Okay, that pro are maybe sort of those KPIs that are probably defining the future of, of your companies from a B2B obviously perspective. In the end, it's always the same now. Growth, revenue, and profitability. <laughs> if you grow, you have great big revenues and you are profitable. In the end, meaning valuation are based on multiple of revenues and EBITDA. So on the long run, it's the only thing that really counts. With some exceptions, but I don't like speaking about exceptions, because then people always remember exceptions and they forget the reality. Okay, so growth, revenue, profitability. Going a bit deeper. <laughs> I would say uh, churn, for me, is key. I mean, uh, uh, the, the, the number of clients or, or revenue that you're losing. Uh, satisfaction, net promoter score. If, if the clients are happy, you will be successful, and then you have to be an obsessive of, of that. And I, I would say an, another KPI that I, I loved that was a number of new meetings with clients because at the end, new revenue comes because you are pitching against new clients and you cannot expect of, of building new revenue if you don't have X number of new meetings per, per week or per month. So at the end, a KPI of number of new pitch, uh, pitches every, every week, I think is key. Not to add more, more KPIs, like more like a, a thought. We, we have a sheet in Carto with 150 KPIs, right? Like <laughs> everything there. It doesn't matter. You could have 150, 2,000, 1 million. It matters which of those 150 are the ones that the leadership is continuously looking and talking about. So that the whole organization knows about that. If only you are not sleeping because of MRR growth and the product team doesn't care, then when you ask them to do something for the MRR, they will say, no, that's not, not my thing. So you need to communicate continuously the same KPIs that make you stay awake, you need to make every other member of the team stay awake at night and not a sheet with 150 KPIs, right? Yeah. Very good. So, uh, so that effectively is, is going to the next question, which is, okay, what sort of culture do you want to bring in the organization? Because, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, what senior management is focused on, in the end, it probably sort of becomes a bit of a of a culture or, a, or an organizational objective, no? I mean, what sort of culture and organizational objectives do you feel that, that are, are good and that are sort of producing that level of growth that will take you to 100, 200 million? Is, is there something that you have seen, hey, in order to really, really scale it, and I'm not just talking about sort of f f Friday pizzas and things like that, no? But, but something that you've seen that has really evolved and has made a difference somehow in how you are uh, thinking about the organization. I have two, two, thoughts, two thoughts around around that. One is what is not written and easily explainable then disappears when you are over 50, right? With 
under 50, just the old guy of the organization can explain everybody else. Over 50 with four offices we have now, we have like the cultural Bible. Now, it doesn't need to be 100, 100 pages, 10 pages that explain the values, what we stand for, what we try to do, how we treat people, how we expect to be treated. And that needs to be understood and needs to be coherent, right? This is just some, I don't know, uh, cheesy words that nobody follows and doesn't mean anything. But if, if you have it written and you follow it, that's super important. So really sit and, and, and write it down. And the other thing is that what I manage in sales in the organization, you cannot let sales control everything, right? Because then, it's, then you will not innovate anymore. Then you will not do the nice things that made you want to do this in the first place, right? So our revenue is the key goal. We want to get returns and profitability. But it cannot be that the whole exec or the whole culture is only a sales culture because then in innovation would die and then you would be out of business in, in two years. I would add two things. I agree 100%. I would, like, the, the culture of let's do it is, is uh, not talk too much about things. Let's do it and fail fast. Uh, um, we have to try lots of things, fail fast, change and do things. I think it's the only way of, of moving. I think we all have these uh, values and stuff like this written on the, on the wall in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's, it's necessary. Uh, but I think in the end, the values you want to transmit, there are two things important to do. The first one, any founder has to really represent the values. If you, I don't know, for employee in Kentucky, we have a work hard. I think the founders, we are the ones working most hours every week. So there is no debate, they see us working extremely hard. Uh, and the other thing is anytime someone is not really fitting, you fire him immediately. So founders represent the values, people that don't fit the value are out. This is the best way, more than writing things and doing philosophy, uh, you enforce the values on a daily basis. One comment to the, the firing thing, which everybody does, right? You, you need to be firing fast, but you, you want to be so nice that we went to a point where we just, just celebrating that yeah. this guy is going to this new adventure or whatever. We're creating so much confusion in the company, right? It's like, all these people are leaving. The worst guys are leaving because they don't want to even be working here. <laughs> so at some point, you need to also explain in a pretty honest way when you fire, why you are fired, and that you are effectively firing. And you cannot hide that to the organization. It's, it needs to be a natural thing, even if it hurts. Well, you know, very often when you fire someone, you discover that anyone in his team is very happy that he has been fired. Yeah. <laughs> so it's very unusual that you fire someone and people say, oh, he was an amazing guy, a great, a great value brought to the team. No, usually, most of the teams then say, you are nice, thank you. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and uh, uh, one last question. I mean, when, when we all think about sort of your, your companies, you know, we all think sort of about, about uh, and we think about revenue, we think about nice graphs like doing like that, no? I mean, from, from zero to 100, like straight lines, re growth, and so forth. But then there's something that sometimes I've found which is called midlife crisis, no? I mean, <laughs> have you had any of those in your companies? I mean, where are they coming from? Is it... I mean, can you expect them, and, and, if you, and if you can tell us just a, a quick tip about how to try to avoid them? Every day, right? Yeah, every day. <laughs> every day, uh, a small one, and every month, a big one, and every year, an existential one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these hockey sticks graphs are not made, if you look at them in detail, there are just steps where you don't grow, but then you grow more, and you don't, and, and it's, this is the reality of things. Yeah. And then if you look at this from very far away, it's yeah. like, wow, you're going like crazy, but when you are in a plateau, and you are thinking, holy shit, this in is In B2B, maybe much more than in B2C, more. yeah. Much more. So gross is a step gross. Yeah. And, and, and you feel like that this is due because of those, those changes in the sales function, or because of the product, or changes company? I company? think that uh, sometimes, for example, in sales, uh, you're selling at the beginning and, and you're doing, doing well, but you haven't established a, a, project, a, a process yet, so you don't know how to scale. And then until you don't realize how you, th those two good sales people that you have, that they are selling a lot, until you don't understand why they are selling a lot and you can establish a process that you can uh, replicate and, and, and you can scale, you don't start to grow faster. So sometimes these are the, the problems that you are not ready to to scale because you don't have the, the process prepared. Excellent. 
Okay, guys. So, uh, uh, so, so, so listen. I, I think that um, I mean, as a token of gratitude for this uh, fantastic talk, they are all selling to companies. Okay, guys. You all have companies. Please go on the website, sign up as clients, and they will be very happy with that. Okay. <laughs> said that. Listen. Thanks a lot for having me here.